Welcome to the Brian Callen Show. Uh, today, I interviewed Mike Ritland. Mike Ritland is a former Navy SEAL. I think he was a SEAL for like 12 years. And then saw, I think, a Belgian Malinois, a Dutch shepherd, um, on deployment. And he kind of got fascinated. He'd always had dogs, but hunting dogs. And he saw this working dog, this war dog and saw what it was able to do, and he became obsessed with dog training. So when he got out of the teams, um, he ended up becoming this renowned dog trainer. His dogs, I think, go for something like $200,000. I mean, but those dogs, it's a three-year process of training. And um, I'm going to release some, I don't know if it's going to be a best of, but I'm going to definitely release some footage of what this 67-pound dog felt like on my arm like it's very disconcerting to think that a 67 pound animal can crush your arm i was wearing a bite suit and the the pressure was astonishing and i was just like oh my god getting bit by a dog you see like some skinny little shepherd and you're like whatever oh yeah until it's trained to hate you which is what this was about but He's a, I didn't know he was a best-selling author. He wrote this book called Unfuck America. And, uh, you know, it's basically an open conversation. An open, respectful conversation, I think, about life. And what I always find fascinating about guys like this, people who were typically like a Navy SEAL or whatever, my experience with operators, and I might be wrong, I'm making a generalization, but my personal experience with operators, guys like Mike Ritlin, Mike Ritlin is that, they're so eclectic in their thinking. They're so thoughtful. They're so, uh, so they're not extremists in any way. And they have a very, very good and strong understanding of concepts like masculinity, courage, freedom. They've really thought these things through. So that for the most part, a guy like Mike Ritland really understands where he stands, why he stands there, and what he's willing to fight for. And I think that's very important. He's a fully realized human being. Yes, very tough. Yes, it's proved that he can ignore pain and do all the things that a Navy SEAL can do. But that's less interesting to me. So, so you know, a lot of times people want to know someone's story. I'm less interested in Mike Ritland's story and way more interested in what he has learned from that story. You know, so we did this podcast. We'll get into it in a second, but I just wanted to give you guys some some you know head, heads up on it. We talked about courage, and he's learned more about courage by training dogs and maybe about people and these concepts um, than he would have if he hadn't trained dogs. And so a lot of it was the dogs are great, but they're also a metaphor for life. And training a dog to actually have the courage to attack somebody takes a long time, even if they're a badass dog. So. I thought that was very interesting. I learned a lot here. We had a really, really interesting conversation about uh, what's, what kind of comes to mind is really the concept of courage. What is courage? What is it? You know, it, it, I, I have trouble even believing that courage is a thing. And what I mean by that is, um, I mean, are you afraid and do you do it anyway? That would be considered courage. If you, if, you're, if you feel brave, if you feel no fear, and you go and do something, is that courage or is that ignorance to the dangers that could be, that lurk below? You know? To me, courage is when you're scared shitless, but you assume the position anyway. Isn't, isn't that kind of the way you define courage? So it's not so much a feeling, it might be an action. There, there is a separation there. And I feel the same way about masculinity. You know, what, what is masculinity? I, I, I'm, I, I know that I'm very, very fortunate and happy that I live in a world where Tim Curry in the Rocky Horror Picture Show can dress up like a woman and challenge all those gender kind of like ideas that we have. Or... Uh, my favorite musical, believe it or not, is Hedwig and the Angry Inch. If you don't know what that is, go check it out. 
It's about, this was in the 90s, I think. Look at where, when Hedwig and the Angry Inch came up. Because I was thinking about this, because I, I, I have this whole, I'm very sort of, um, I'm very against, for the most part, the principle of, of um, gender ideology with children. I don't think they're ready for that. As Sam Tripoli says, it's advanced algebra. Let kids be kids and figure out their gender on their own when they're 18 if they want to, if they feel truly confused, then, then you can take the actions you want as an adult. But, but, but having said that, when was it Hedwig and the Angry Inch? 1998. This was about, this, this, uh, John Cameron Mitchell, so talented, wrote a musical about a, uh, a, a, a man who gets the operation. It's botched, and he has, he's left with like a little mound of flesh. It's an inch. It's an inch-long dick. It's called Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Hedwig, he wears a wig and the Angry Inch. And it's about this uh, someone who, who, who is trans, a transsexual person, who, uh, and, and it's a musical, and it's, it's fucking genius. And it's always been my favorite musical, if I even have a, I'm not a big musical guy, but, but so, so it's not that I'm coming at this with this traditional mass, even though I, I'm probably pretty traditional in my masculinity and my masculine expression, and I feel more comfortable with that, and I'm probably more conservative in that sense, but it's not lost on me that, Part of what gives our culture flavor um, and makes it interesting is that we allow for people to express themselves in any way they want, which includes being able to have an operation and wear a wig or whatever it is you want to do. But, you know, when I talk to guys like Mike Ridlin, what I'm interested in is these concepts like masculinity, these concepts like courage especially with somebody who has gone down that rabbit hole to the nth degree. When you're a Navy SEAL, you're a Spartan. It, it couldn't be, it's, it's the most masculine expression I can think of. You're a warrior, you know. You, 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 you breach doorways, you go and fight terrorists in a strange land, etc., etc. I mean, that requires the concept of masculinity and courage, which, by the way, to me, seem to be synonymous. But you better be careful when, when you, you better be careful how you define those things, and you better be careful with, with talking about those things in a way that puts you in a box, that puts your masculinity and your concept of courage in this very strong, traditional box. Because if you do that, you're probably going to limit yourself. And I hope I'm, I'm hope I'm, I'm actually, as I talk to you, I'm, 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 I'm thinking this through myself because I think that when you have too strong a concept of something like intelligence, masculinity, courage, you, um, if, if, if those concepts and those definitions for you are outlined in bold you know, in bold, with bold lines, unmovable lines, you're probably limiting yourself. You're probably lying to yourself. You're probably, in fact, ironically, not being as masculine as you could be, as brave as you could be, as smart as you could be. So maybe that's what I'm trying to say. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Mike Ritland. Before we go, please understand, I will be I will be in Venice at the Venice West Theater in Los Angeles, December 27th, doing stand-up, um, Venice West. Um, and uh, that's at 1717 Lincoln Boulevard. So if you're in Venice or anywhere in Los Angeles, come check it out. Still tickets to BrianCallen.com. Boston, Massachusetts, Laugh Boston, December 29, 30, 31. I'm doing stand-up. I'm ringing in the New Year in Boston at Laugh Boston, one of my favorite clubs. San Diego, California, Mic Drop Comedy Club, January 5, 6, and 7. Fort Wayne, Indiana, Summit Comedy Club, January 13, 14, 15, or actually 13 and 14. Then Dania, Florida, Dania Improv, which is about a half hour outside of Miami, January 19, 2021. Um, and then just go to BrianCallen.com for all my live dates. I'm coming to a town near you. As always, this podcast brought to you by, um, well, Magic Mind. I, I'm not sponsored by Magic Mind. I make no money off of them, but I think Magic Mind is amazing. It's a mushroom tincture 
that I really believe in. Try it and let me know what you think. Magic Mind. Uh, and also Toe Hold. Um, the best flip-flops on planet Earth. The most expensive, but they're worth it because it takes about 500 steps to make one pair of flip-flops. Um, and uh, we're going to release a video with the strongest man in the world trying to destroy those flip-flops, and he couldn't. But we're not just a flip-flop company. We got wallets. We got bags. We got rash guards. We got all kinds of stuff. So check it out. Toehold, shoptoehold.com. Go to the Instagram, give us a follow. And by the way, now, thanks to our reorganization, um, you will have a turnaround of about two weeks when you order your flip-flops. You don't have to wait as long as you used to because um, uh, we crushed it this holiday season. We had so many orders, it got crazy. We had to shut down, I think, just orders. We didn't push them as hard, but we're taking orders again. So thank you to everybody that made Toe Hold so successful. All right, without further ado, I give you Mike Ritland. Enjoy this. I know I did, and I learned a lot. Mike Ritland, ladies and gentlemen. You know what I want to do today? I'm going to jack that car. If you come in like, you know, that kind of shit, like then they're almost for sure going to bite you. I mean, I'm one with nature. Yeah, I can tell. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> and the dog understands me. Yeah, we communicate good. well. Give me that thing. Whoa, whoa. Okay. Dude. Dude. <laughs> Dude. That's not cool. Brian Callen. This is his intro song. Brian Callen. It's one hell of an intro song. His comedy is marvelous. He's a genius in world I'm here with Mike Ritland and uh, former Navy SEAL. And now you train dogs. You train dogs to bite people. That's pressure. Go that way now. Indeed. And you, and you uh, rehabilitate dogs of war that have PTSD. Can dogs have PTSD? They can. Uh, I would say that the, the manifestations of it are very similar in terms of the, you know, pe people and dogs will shut down and it kind of changes you know, how they look at things and, and how they react. It can make them super reactive. Uh, where it differs is, is the ability to use logic and reason to understand the why. You know, for them, it's a simple association. Uh, one, one of the biggest things to keep in mind is dogs' minds work more like a calculator than it does our minds. So everything to them is A plus B equals C. Uh, to, to think about it, you know, any dog that you've ever met has never thought in a language the way that we do. Mm. And so for them, it's, it's this plus this equals that. Um, and so whether it's gunfire, or helicopter noises, explosions, you know, things like that. They when associate. Th they make that association with it. And so you'll see a lot of times where dogs will start to show, uh, you know, symptoms like that is that, you know, they're back at their forward operating base and there's helicopters circling and they start, you know, shivering or they start looking to bite something or, or whatever because the last 37 times that they heard helicopter noises, they ran and, and bit somebody or things blew up or there was a, you know, lots of gunfire, you know, in and over around their head. So it's just making that simple association. So the good thing is the same way that that, that, that context was, was built or made is the same way that you diminish or desensitize them to it. And so you would say like, let's say a dog has high prey drive or likes to play tug. Uh, so now if, if it's gunfire, I'm and gonna- Just so people understand high prey drive, is is they'll chase the ball all day long. Right. Anything moving, they yeah. want to they want to come after. Yeah, and and prey drive relieves stress in a dog. So letting them, um, you know, exercise in in prey drive mentally is a good stress reliever. So maybe you'll you'll fire a 22, 200 uh, yards away. So it's it's gunfire, but it's really quiet. It's distant, and we're playing tug of war while that's happening. And then slowly we'll move that gun closer and closer and closer. Maybe a bigger caliber, or whatever. And next thing you know. Uh, you're playing tug of war and, and there's you know gunfire going off and now the dog has replaced or overwritten kind of like a, a mental hard drive. It's it's overwritten that uh, that negative stimulation or association with that stimuli. So w the one thing I always want to know is because dogs have such acute hearing, mm -hmm. if if you shoot a 45 or a 357 even outside, you know your 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 ears are taking a beating. Yeah. And when you have ears that are that sensitive, how are they able to not flip out well it, some of it's kind of relative keep in mind that their their hearing is always way more sensitive than ours so that is 10 times 100 times as loud as as it is to you and i so it's kind of all percentage wise relative having said that 
their hearing is super sensitive and, and there's been a, a pretty good paradigm shift as far as utilizing canine hearing protection uh, for those those types of applications here over the last decade uh, because it is detrimental you know if dogs yeah. that have been in a lot of gunfights just like us humans uh, you know go deaf pretty quick and and it's pretty pretty damaging to their ears so yeah uh, but similarly you know desensitizing uh, that uh, stimuli to them early on is key uh, and so when they're really young just like a, a bird dog you know getting them around shotgun noises from the start you know we do this uh, um, kind of mechanism or, or series of batteries that uh, puts young puppies through uh, different auditory stimulus like there's these uh, spookless horse CDs that that will play that has like gunfire and, and thunder and you know loud trains and honking horns and uh, you know, firecrackers going off, and it's just like this loop of these crazy sounds that, that puppies, like while they're nursing, will expose to these sounds so that they make that positive association and, and they get used to it really, really early on. How long does it take for you to take a puppy? You sell dogs, you, you'll sell a protection dog, Correct. personal protection dog, right? right? And there's a, I'm a little bit of a geek with this. Yeah. I was thinking about this because I've, my fantasy has always been to own a working you know, dog. I've, yeah. I own, I have owned twice working German Shepherd dogs. Yeah. But the amount of training that goes into actually making them a patrol dog or a personal protection dog is something that obviously it's not a skill set I have or the time. But how long does it take if I, if I said you, you get a great puppy and I said I want a personal protection dog from soup to nuts, how long would that take? So it, it really has to start from almost birth, uh, you know, so ultimately it's, it's a few years. I'd say between two and a half and three and a half years is, is from my perspective. Two and a half to three and a half years. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so the dog is going to be three years old. Like all the dogs that I sell personal protection wise are three years old when Damn. I sell them. But here's the thing to keep in mind, and, and there are companies that sell dogs at, you know, 12, 18 months old. Um, you know, everybody do, do your own thing and, and uh, more power to you. But for me, there's a level of mental maturity that has to be there to do some of the training that we're going to put that dog through. The, the really chaotic, dynamic, stressful, where I'm in that dog's head and I make him understand that I'm, I'm there to, to be a predator towards him. Um, you know, you, you don't want to do that with a dog that's not fully mentally mature. And so even if I'm starting the dog at six weeks old doing rag work and, and using using food to, um, you know, and, and fans to help him, you know, trust his nose and be successful there. Uh, as I build him up, there's certain scenarios, especially on bite work, where I'm not going to get in the dog's head. I'm not going to uh, kind of put those those spiders in his mind as, as far as the, the defensive side of it. Because just like if you take, a, say, a 12-year-old 12, 12 kid and you put them through, you know, combat scenarios, like that's going to fuck them up, you know. Yeah, so, of course. Uh, and, and no you gotta build their confidence. Right. And, and so, but just like with human beings is that, you know, a lot of times these dogs at, at you know, 12, 15 months old are big enough, strong enough and capable of, of fucking somebody up, but you still don't want to put them through that. No different than say, uh, say Mike Tyson, you know, when he was 15, like he could, he could hand almost any grown man their ass, Yeah. but I still wouldn't want to, you know, put him in charge of the checkbook or, or, you know, the no. security decisions. Um, you know, for a family at that age, you know, so. What, how many hours, have you ever calculated how many hours you put into a dog by the time you sell it at three years old? I mean, I haven't, but it's for sure thousands. It's you know, thousands. Thousands of hours, absolutely. So I would imagine the dogs are not cheap. No, I mean, they're, they're six figures and above for. Six figures and above. Yeah. But that would kind of make sense because it took you three years of work. That's well, yeah. a three-year project. Yeah. If you break that down, that might be like minimum wage you're getting paid. I mean, I'm not saying, but yeah. but it's, you know, that's that's a lot of work. How many dogs do you train at a time? Uh, usually just one. So I've got a, a fairly good pipeline set up where, you know, different phases of the training, there's, there's kind of the, once they're selected and brought in, we do a kind of a, a foundational phase. And then there's kind of an intermediate phase and then the kind of the final preparation phase and there's different people doing those different phases. So um, ideally, um, you know, it's about a six month turnaround from the time they come in until we'll deliver them, six, you know, six, maybe eight months uh, in most cases. But um, there's, there's those different kind of facets of training. Uh, so yeah, I mean, from an, an hourly wage standpoint, like you're not making a ton of money if you, if you base it on, uh, on that. But the other thing to keep in mind too is that you know, most people look at that and say, you know, that's a lot of money for a dog, and agreed, it is. Uh, having said that, you know, if you amortize it over a 10-year period and it's a security investment, 
you know, what you're spending per year on, on if you were to compare it to, say, uh, you know, a, a handful of security uh, staff or, or executive protection guys that are following you around or whatever, like it's, it's a drop in the bucket by comparison. And, and the thing about a dog is that, like, that fucker's sleeping with you, it's traveling with you. Uh, and once it's bonded with you, like, it doesn't have kids that you can kidnap and, and have ransom on or, or blackmail to get to, you know, to the client or, or what have you. So they're not going to be bribed with money. They're not going to be bypassed the way, say, a, a security and an alarm system is. Yeah, I, I, you know, they, they, some cop said, you know, he said, if any dog, especially a German Shepherd. Yeah. You know, my friend's house got broken into, and he said in 30 years... Of, of being a, uh, I guess he's the guy who would investigate home invasions and stuff, yeah. 30 years. Never, not once, did a criminal come into a house with a German Shepherd. Yeah, because you just choose the next house. I don't want to deal with that yeah. dog. Yeah, I mean, the FBI stats are 95% are of, of all criminals will avoid a house with any type of dog. Yeah. You know, so to me, the, uh, the cheese dick um, advertising uh, phrase that I came up with is like, you know, Trichos dogs are for that other 5%. You know, it's, it's for the... Trichos the, dogs the, the guy for that, the other 5%. Yeah. Well, and that 5% exists. For sure it there, does. There are men who, who are not afraid of dogs. And Absolutely. Come in. Well, and, and so that's, that's kind of what you're dealing with, you know, talking about the, the unicorn that you have to find, uh, you know, for, for this type of an environment is, is you're, you're looking for a dog that's both physically and mentally capable as well as trained to take on a, a, a human being that's you know five six times its size, uh, not scared of them, uh, physically capable of injuring the dog and intent on doing so. So if, if all of those boxes are checked, which there are human beings out there that are breaking into people's houses that check all of those boxes, to to find a dog that can deal with somebody like that is is a very special animal. Um, yeah, I've read that there's prey drive and then there's fight drive. And a lot of guys will only, what, as far as that, for, for that 5%, a lot of trainers will only deal, they only will really trust a male dog, an uncircumcised, I mean, an un, un, uncast, like an intact male yeah. dog to actually take the fight to that 5% of a guy who's, who's you yeah. know, hopped up on something in 6'4", 235 or something. Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, any of the females that I have uh, worked with, that, that if I put them through the same test as a male, uh, perform every bit as good as any, any male I've God, ever you're had. you're so progressive, yeah. dude. Yeah, well, you're you know. such a feminist, and well, I love that. Well, see, I Who mean, says that yeah. ex-Navy SEALs yeah. aren't woke? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I would say that, but uh, in terms of any other... Uh, uh, I guess I, ideology that you get my opinion on, you, you probably uh, it, it would be pretty predictable. But uh, you know. with his American flag yeah, yeah. on his on his, on yeah. his shirt. But well, but no, I mean to me that you know, like I was saying earlier, the, the test is what it is. You know, it's yeah. irrespective of sex. You know, so if if that female does all of the things that I need to do, then then it's going to be just as good as any other dog. The, the key is is being super selective and being exceptionally thorough in your testing. I mean, I, I am very very hard on the dogs. Uh, and we, we put them through a lot of different um, criteria to ensure that they're going to be what they need to be once, once they're. The tricky part is to find a dog that has the ability to do all of that, but that's also going to be okay with your kids and, and yeah, other pets. Yeah, who's not going to bite and, and whoever just comes in. Yeah. Uh, it is tricky, you know, because it, it stands to reason that a dog that's physically capable of all of that isn't going to put up with, you know, the, the five-year-old with a wiffle ball bat smacking a dog in the, nut, in the nuts or grabbing their ears or taking food from them or... Yeah. Uh, screaming and, and tickling each other and running around the Christmas so they, they, tree. So your dogs, most dogs like that, when you train them, it's a hard thing for them to distinguish between a child who's not a threat and an ad adult male? Or? No. I mean, if the selection process has been done correctly uh, and the genetics of the dog are uh, appropriate, then no. Uh, you know, to me, a good, strong, confident dog absolutely understands the difference between what's threatening and what's not, whether yeah. it's a grown man that's six five, that's very neutral and not not doing anything squirrely, uh, or you know an old uh, you know elderly person or a young kid or, or whatever, and, and they, they will display patience and, and almost a, a gingerness with things that they understand are not physically threatening. I mean, to me, that's really the the exudation of ch uh, true and pure confidence. You know, yes. the the type of dogs that are really sharp that want to fuck up everything that moves. To me, that that's a more nervy, edgy dog. That, that I know that like if I get in a suit and really uh, test the the oil on on that dog that he's probably not going to be there you know he's going to break j just like with people yeah. you know the loud yep. mouth that 
runs his mouth and, and uh, is picking fights and shit like that is usually not the guy that, that you have to worry about as much. Well, you know, that's I was t I was talking to you before about that. Like, one of the things I, I I really appreciate about operators. You know, my friends always tease me. They're like, oh, like, let me guess, are you friends with another Navy SEAL? Yeah. It's but but I I like whenever I speak to a lot of guys who are in special operations. What I always notice is a couple of things. One, they have high social intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the sense of humor. Uh, don't take themselves too seriously yeah. because they had to be part of a team and that a lot of times their participation in that team and the protocols that go with that team, the cooperation, putting the other guy first, were, um, were uh, the, the, the price for not doing so was life and death. Sure. Second of all, there's a way more, especially if they've been combat tested, there's a very intimate relationship between life and death. So they don't come at you in a macho way. There's very little bravado and very little macho shit because it seems they have seen how easy it is to kill, to, for a human being to die. Yeah. I don't care how muscular you are, I don't care what you can bench press, you get, everybody dies pretty much the same way with the right weaponry. Sure. Technology can just, you're flesh and bone, yeah. and it's great that you can run 50 miles and bench 300 pounds, but you know, a, a bullet well placed, uh, you know, is, is the end of your life. Um, and secondly, I, I've noticed that, and maybe it's, it's something that was there beforehand, but um, guys like yourself, um, one of the things I've, I've clocked is that they tend to be very entrepreneurial when they come out of yeah. the teams or when they come out of special operations. And Part of it's because they seem to have very eclectic interests. Yeah. They tend to be very, very sort of well-rounded and interested in a lot of different things. You know, not, not just guns and, you know, and shooting and all that shit. In fact, that's almost like something that they had to do as a job, but now they're interested in whatever it might be, just, yeah. just the bigger ideas. Yeah. And so for you, having been in this extreme situation, Navy SEAL, you know, being there in combat. And I think you, t you told me that you kind of got bit by the dog bug when you saw uh, a working dog on deployment. Yeah, so uh, I was on an Iraq deployment and, and growing up, you know, I grew up with bird dogs and then got into, into hog dogs for a number of years and, and was, a, you know, kind of a, uh, from an animal husbandry standpoint, I, I was into all aspects of dogs, more so than just, you know, being a pet owner. Did you hunt hog? I, I did. And um, so catch dogs, were those like pit bulls or yeah, mixes? Yeah, or, or dogo argentinos, you know, big, yeah. uh, big kind of uh, molasser mixes. Um, yeah. But, you know, the, what really kind of piqued my interest was there, there was a group of Marines in the area uh, that we were working in that, that had a bomb dog with them that basically, you know, saved a, a group of their lives. And for me, that was kind of the light switch of saying, you know, we've been in the same scenario, I don't know how many times, and we never had a dog with us. Uh, and, and I just, you know, kind of became addicted to it, you know, right then and there. And so for the next better part of a decade, uh, just became kind of head first into everything I could, I could learn and, and uh, be taught about uh, dogs in general as it related to, you know, military working dogs and, and that, that type of industry. So, um, you know, for me, it was, it was kind of a culmination of, you know, growing up being a, a dog guy and, and, you know, loving what I did in special operations and kind of being able to marry those two things together was really a dream come true. And then, you know, once I, I got out of the military and, and started my own dog company, coming back as uh, you know, the, the trainer for the West Coast SEAL canine program, it was kind of like the best of everything for me. Um, you know, because I was still working with a lot of guys that I'd either worked with or had been a SEAL instructor with. I was working with dogs at a really, really high level, getting to go overseas and select dogs and come back and travel the country and do really high speed, awesome fucking training. Uh, and ultimately, you know, hand, hand guys that I knew, loved and trusted and had served with the other end of the leash and, and you know, watching them go, go overseas with a dog that we had, had worked with together, you know. So did did you awesome. work primarily Dutch Shepherds and Malinois? Primarily, yeah. We had... Why, uh, why, why wouldn't you, why don't I ever see people using Rottweilers, Dobermans, German Shepherds, even yeah. Pit Bulls or Mixes? Why, why don't you use those dogs? So it's a combination of factors. I would say primarily it's that all of the kind of working traits and genetic tools that that a dog has to possess to be able to do that type of work uh, just does not exist in any other breeds that I've come across other than Malinois, Dutch Shepherds, and German Shepherds. So take, for example, you know, a Rottweiler, like a, a really 
well-bred, you know, security guard or guard dog type of Rottweiler. He, he may be great in bite work, um, you know, and can take people down or, or things of that nature, but probably doesn't have a, a very good hunt drive. You know, it, from a detection standpoint, is not very good. What do you mean by that? It's just not as good a nose. Yeah, so not not. I can a, just see all the Rottweiler people going. Yeah. That guy doesn't know what he's talking about, that's, man. And that's fine. You know, yeah. start your own company and and yeah. see, Work how, with see how many and see what happens. Well, see how many Rottweilers you sell to, to police and military working dogs. Yeah, because they just don't because they because what they don't have. The nose, they, they're not good at, well, at detection? It, generally speaking, yes. I mean, that and, and in conjunction with, you know, if you have to patrol in 10 kilometers, you know, and, and be, you know, in a harness and, and you know, picked up and handed over a, a wall and, and things, things of that nature. Yeah, I mean, a, a big clumsy dog like that is not an ideal candidate for yeah. that. So the neat thing about Malinois, Dutch Shepherds, and, and good well-bred working line German Shepherds is that they're, they're kind of a jack of all trades type of dog. You know, they're, they're athletic, they're fast, they're strong, they're, you know, they, they can bite hard, they have good noses. They're good in temperature too, right? They can be good yeah. in cold, they can be good in yeah. heat. Yeah, I mean, they, they, can, they can adapt to anything, you know, yeah. and so it, it's just, yeah, I mean, they, they kind of check all of the boxes. I mean, like I said, there's a lot of other breeds that, that may check some of them, um, but to check all of them to be able to do all of those things from that kind of pure utilitarian standpoint, uh, Malinois and Shepherds are, are really kind of where it's at, you know, and, and for me, it's not a preference. Like people ask me all the time, like, why do you prefer Malinois? And, and I don't. Uh, You're you know, just strict utility. Yeah, like if I came across the fucking giant schnauzer or a, a Labradoodle that had all the things, I would use it. Yeah. You know, like if, if it can do what I need it to do, like the, the more dogs I can find that, that fit that bill and, and are applicable to what I'm trying to accomplish, the better. It's just, you know, from my experience and most people's working experience, um, you know, you just don't find all of those traits in those other breeds. So when you see a puppy, right? So I say I, I'm, I'm, I so badly want, I so badly want a Malinois yeah. and I also want a German Shepherd or just anything. And I want that dog to be right here, but I want him to be friendly with everybody until yeah. a dude comes at me with a knife and I can be like, get him! Or the yeah. just dog knows. I don't know if that's a command, get yeah. him, but that's my command. Yeah. Kill it, that it fucker. Yeah. But like, what do you look for in a dog, in a puppy, well, I don't want the dog biting people because, you know, I don't want the dog looking at somebody in a puffy jacket and going, yeah, game time, you know, yeah. I can't deal with that because I don't want to get sued. So, so when you look at a dog, let's say it's an eight week old dog, 10 week old dog, I don't know, three months, what do you, what kind of, what should people be looking for? Like just a guy like me who wants to go buy a dog maybe and have it trained a little bit. Yeah. The first thing I would do is move away from California, you know. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but, Get out of California. Uh, yeah, that'll save you a lot of headaches with uh, with owning uh, ass eater dogs to begin with. But <laughs> it's so true. Yeah, but uh, so I, you know, actually, I have a lot of clients in California because the gun laws are so restrictive and whatever. So it is a yeah. it is a good uh, alternative. Not them, anymore, but, by the way. Yeah. Now in yeah. now in Los Angeles, you go. This is how you do it. You go to the LAPD and you, you you apply for a gun. They go get out of here. Then you go to the LA Sheriff's Department. The sheriffs are like, dude. Just sign the dotted line. So it's <laughs> pretty that cool. Easy, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really. So well, I got, or, or you can just use your car and run people over and, and walk, apparently. That's, there's yeah. also yeah. that. Or I get a Navy SEAL friend like yourself with yeah. a dog. Yeah. I take this finger, I loop it in your belt loop, and yeah. I just follow you yeah. around very close. <laughs> yeah, that so there's that too. Yeah. yeah. There's uh, a lot of different ways to keep yourself yeah. safe. Uh, but in, in terms of what you look for in a puppy, I mean, at, at a young age, you're really only looking for a few key uh, you know, components, which is a ton of confidence. Uh, high prey drive and a dog's willingness to, to use its nose and, and kind of be successful with it. And so something as simple as taking, uh, as you're weaning a, a puppy away from its mom, taking like a small desk fan and putting it behind their food and, and putting it, you know, 30 yards away from wherever you're keeping them, letting them out and just letting them come into that odor cone and they, they snake back and forth, they find the food and they're successful. A, a dog that's willing to do that at six, seven, eight weeks old, tells you that, okay, the dog has good hunt drive, uh, he's willing to use and trust his nose, and then I can, I can reward or reinforce and, and make him successful by doing so is, is a good start. If the dog likes to kind of spider monkey all over playground equipment or you take them to Home Depot or Lowe's uh, and they're crawling all over, you know, fencing and, and walking past plywood getting cut in half and shit like that, uh, dogs that are kind of fearless and will, will go anywhere and, and, and independent of their, their litter mates, by the way, taking them by themselves into areas where you know they've never been and, and that's what's gonna really tell you if they're competent. If you go to somebody's house and it's 
in their backyard where the, the puppy has spent its entire fucking life and it's with nine other litter mates and its mom. Like, yeah, it's, it's really easy for that puppy to look and act like fucking King Kong. You're like, wow, that dog's biting my, my pants and is a total badass. Remove him from that environment. Take him somewhere by himself he's never been. And it's 99% of the time a totally different story. See, so, I never thought of that. That yeah. seems so simple. Yeah. But that, but that you could apply that to any dog, couldn't you? 100%. I mean, yeah. that, you know, to me, like the adopt, don't shop thing which most people I get that you know your heart's in the right place and the intent is pure but you know the road to hell is paved in good intentions and you know if, if you look at decades of, of trying to adopt dogs out that are you know nerve bags and skittish and, and have all of these fucking problems I've done it yeah you know and and you know again it, it's very commendable I've done it um, you know and, and people's heart again is in the right place but if you look at it from kind of the big picture is that what what it really is 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 that we're creating a a revolving demand for shitty bred dogs. Um, mm. You know, we, we, for decades we've we've got you know the, the most elaborate network of well-funded um, you know shelters and, and rescues all over the country of any place in the world. But we have you know more dogs in that environment than we've ever had before. That's so uh, interesting. Yeah, and, and it's and it's because people are are adopting them, unfortunately, and and it, it is a shitty. Um, kind of duality that way and that you know people need to be much more selective and when they go and not buy shitty bread dogs and, and not take nerve bags that, that are going because to because problems. when you do that you perpetuate the, the demand for the it. demand for it but also more of those dogs right, right? because that those those traits can be passed on yeah. and now you get more dogs in the pound yeah so See, that's I never, again something i never thought yeah about. so if you think about it like from the, the craigslist classifieds backyard you know 200 bucks champion line pup ads that you see yeah flooding every city in in the country is that if nobody <clears throat> bought those dogs right and if shelters didn't accept them, like there's going to be a period that's going to suck really bad for that kind of generation. But of you dogs. have less dogs out there without a home, right? But uh, yeah, I mean, like backyard breeders, like if if nobody's buying those dogs, they're they're not going to continue to breed them. If they can't dump them off at shelters in droves, nobody is gonna is going to keep breeding them, you know. And so again, there's like it, it's going to get worse before it gets better to to fix that problem. But I mean, to me, it's like the war on drugs or or anything else like that. It's like, look at, at how long we've spent, look how much money we've dedicated, and we've we've had this same fucked up way of, of trying to tackle it, and it hasn't worked, Yeah. you know? Uh, so you, you have to, to change something, you know? And, and, and again, just like with drugs, like, you can try to fuck with the supply all you want. Like, ultimately, if the, if the demand is there, people are gonna find a way to supply it, you know? That's so, exactly right. Uh, unfortunately, it's that way with dogs, and so, to your question, you know, can that that would work even for for normal pups? Yes, and I I would encourage anybody that if they're going to look for a dog, uh, you know, most people say you know don't ever buy a, a bred pedigree dog or whatever. I, I say the opposite. I, I think you should be very selective, and only uh, take or select dogs that that are super confident, that are not nervy, that um, you know will go to these other places that they've never been and, and exude confidence and crawl over things and. But see, that's that's an education that I didn't have. Sure. You know, th th I just learned something. Yeah. I love that because that's something I never thought about. But you may, it makes so much sense and points to an even larger philosophy. Yeah. How's that war on drugs going, everybody? Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, it's very interesting to hear that coming out of a guy, who, an operator too, who who had to be in a war and you know had to go overseas and and part of your part of your job in a way is to be the elbow of American foreign policy, right? It's part of your job is to be an enforcer, uh, regardless of how you want to look at it. There's, yeah. there, when push comes to shove, we send in guys like you and it's like, oh shit, they killed a bunch of Americans. Where are the SEAL teams? Where, yeah. Where's CAG? Where's, you know? Yeah. Um, but that's a, that's a counterintuitive philosophy, it feels like. Did you come to that, did you come to that as a result of working with dogs? A hundred percent. You know, I would say that, you know, in the, in the years that I've been working with dogs, I've actually learned more about people, you know, because of dogs, because of the emotions that people attach to them. And, and when you sell a dog to somebody, like the, the training of the dog component is the easy part. It's, it's the teaching the human being how to do it properly and, and how to not anthropomorphize and attach all of these human emotions and, and think of things through the human being's perspective and not through the dogs. Because again, that A plus B equals C thing is, is I mean, I can't stress that enough. Like anybody like, not just police dogs, like if you have your own dog at home or whatever, if you just stop and think one, one simple thing, which is that dog has never thought in a language. 
it's hard to even wrap your mind around going through your entire life not having an internal monologue. Yeah, you know that, that's that's hard. I'm, as you say that, I'm literally trying to figure out. Yeah, what I mean, that we means. we think in a language, we dream in a language. You know, yeah. I mean, we talk shit about one another in an internal monologue when yeah. you can't stand somebody, and you, and you know, so dogs don't have the ability to do that. They're making very simple associations with everything, and so a simple kind of example of that is, uh, you know, mo most people have seen when you grab a leash and the dog sees that they spin around, and they're barking, and you know, and, and they turn into an absolute motherfucker to even put the leash on. So in some instances to where it becomes a problem or opening the door and let, you know, the dog bolts out the door, you know, things like that. If you think about the, the contextual association is that every time that you've grabbed the leash, you've connected it to the dog's collar and you've gone outside for a walk, right? So that A plus B equals C, the A grabbing the leash, B connecting it to the dog's neck equals C, we go for a walk. That formula has been true and accurate 5,000 times. It's right. never not been accurate. Right. So now... The, Ring the bell and the dog salivates. Right. So now the presence of A equals the anticipation of C, mm. right? So now, now to break that context, the beauty of building it is that you can break it the same way. So now I grab the leash, you know, I, I click it a couple times, maybe I connect it to the dog's neck, I unclip it, I hang it back down, maybe I wrap it around my waist, I sit down. And now the dog looks around like, what the fuck just happened? You know, now his, his world has been completely turned upside down because now math doesn't, doesn't work anymore. It's yes. like common core where two plus two doesn't equal four anymore. Yeah. Uh, well, and that, that sounds like the California schooling system, but keep I, I know. It. So, uh, that sounds like woke ideology. Yeah. Sorry. So it, it's that same, same Are thing. Are you pregnant? Yeah. Anyway. Maybe. Par right. Partially. Keep going. Uh, you know, so it's, it's breaking that context. You know, understanding, you know, most of the inadvertent, uh, or I, I would say most of the undesirable uh, behaviors in dogs have been inadvertently created by human beings building a context that they didn't realize they were building in that same fashion. So, any, like, again, free, free training tip, any undesirable shitty behavior that your dog does that you don't like, work backwards and think about what formula has taken place over and over to, to get to that result and then break that contextual association to... to Somebody said when the, a mailman comes, dogs go crazy, right? They start barking. And it's like, why is this dog barking? But what happens is the mailman comes, the dog goes crazy, then the mailman leaves. And the dog in his mind goes, when I bark, that guy gets the fuck off my property. In Isn't some it? cases, sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that would be, the, that would, that would be the, one of the ways a dog thinks. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Or, you know, another one that I, I uh, tell people a lot of times is that, you know, uh, when dogs start barking, you know, a lot of times people will yell, shut up, you know, or they'll yes. raise their voice and yell at the dog. And to the dog, again, if you put yourself in the dog's shoes, like you, you, the dog has no fucking idea what shut up means, right? Yeah. So in his mind, he's more likely thinking that you're barking with him than, than telling him to shut up because there's no idea what shut up means. Wow. Uh, you know, so just, again, just little things like that, um, you know, the, the door being a, a very common problem. So, uh, you know, most people, somebody knocks on the door, the doorbell rings, dogs lose their mind, they fly over there. So, you know, one of the things we'll do, especially on the personal protection dog side, because there's a lot of liability with a situation like that, is teaching a, a place command. So, you know, this is the front door, here's a dog bed here. And so now I teach the dog to go to, go to the dog bed with a place command uh, without the, the door present at first. Once that's, you know, pretty well dialed in using food, treats, what have you, positive reinforcement, you've got that down where it's on command. Now you in introduce the doorbell and every time the doorbell rings, you give them the place command. Uh, and over time, you, you can pair, pair that with now every time somebody comes to the door, the dog runs over to his dog bed and lays down because you've again, made that contextual association that when you do that, that's how you get fed. And so uh, a lot of the ways that we'll kind of create that foundational training is using food. So I'm not feeding them any less, but instead of just pouring a bowl of food down and setting it in front of the dog's face, now you know, a small handful at a time, eye contact, I mark and reward that. He goes and lays down, I mark and reward that. So throughout the day, he, he's eating his meal in small handfuls for doing the things that I want to do, and it just conditions the dog. What, what do you think of shock collars? I mean, they're a tool and they have their place. Um, where, where people run into trouble is not really knowing how to use them and not using them as a tool, but using them as either a crutch or like a primary uh, program. You know, yes. first things first, build a, a, a trust-based relationship with the dog based on, you know, interaction, time, food. Uh, you know, you've, you've been dependable and predictable and trustworthy for the dog. Shape the behavior using food in the manner of which I just said pair all of the commands, get the dog to where, you know, if you create kind of a dog classroom where you're, uh, you know, a lot of, um, or, or there's not a lot of stimulation and you're, and you're shaping all of this behavior with food, uh, which is important because the same reason you're not going to teach algebra at fucking Six Flags, 
trying to teach your dog uh, at the dog park or you know in the backyard when the kids are playing soccer and there's neighborhood dogs and, and shit it's going to be distracting and hard to learn shape all of those behaviors once you get to that point uh, now start to bring that training into the real world and do low stimulation environments and then kind of slowly graduate up to more and more challenging once you get to that point that's where i would i would introduce a, a remote collar where at the end of the day, you know, if a dog is so driven to where self-rewarding trumps anything that you can give that dog, you have one, one thing left you can do, and Which that's provide a consequence that's going to discourage him from doing right. that. Uh, but don't start out with that. You right. know, don't, don't start out with the dog knows nothing. Let me slap, slap a fucking confidence. car battery on him and, yeah. and fry him every time he fucking looks, you know, in a direction I don't want him to. That's not the, the right way to use it. Well, so, you know, we, I was thinking about the psychology, you know, you, you talked a little bit about how you grew up in Iowa. Dad was a wrestler. And you were talking about the seminal moments or the sort of the, the reason you think. I thought, I've never heard anybody say this. I said, what, what makes you a SEAL? And you said one is the idea that you probably have this genetic abnormality, which is in many ways a negative, but can be a positive if you're a warrior, which is this lack of self-preservation. Yeah. This ability to kind of just be like, well, I'm kind of dead anywhere, or it's going to end eventually, so fuck it, here we yeah. go, right? That's fascinating. I never actually heard anybody say that because a lot of, a lot of the guys I know tend to also be very risk averse. They're very rational about it, which I'm sure comes with the territory as well. Yeah. But that comes with being an operator. But then the other thing was your experience of getting the shit kicked out of you, mm -hmm. and your dad saying, "Hey, man." Uh, I, I could go and fix this problem for you, but in real life, I'm not always going to be there. Yeah. That that sort of that jarring sort of thing that went on. And yeah. then and then the third thing I think was that you were a swimmer or what was uh, the third well, it was, thing? It was martial arts. Oh, right, uh, martial arts. Yeah, yeah. you talked about I mean, martial and, arts. And, and sort of the discipline. Yeah. But, you know, what I'm actually, I've always been fascinated with, and maybe one of the reasons I love talking to operators or athletes or, you know, I've always liked the fight game and I, is I've always been obsessed with courage. And I've always been obsessed with what, how you define a courage. In fact, I always, and I, I mistakenly have always created a, a sort of a sy symbiosis relationship between masculinity and courage. Because the problem with that is that women are just as courageous in their own way. Yeah, now who's progressive? Uh, thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's clip that out. Yeah. But you know, I don't like this, I don't, I've never, I, as I get older, I get embarrassed when people start talking about being brave or this bravado shit. Yeah. It always kind of, um, as I get older, it embarrasses me a little bit because I think courage, like intelligence, is compartmentalized. You know, you can be very socially intelligent and have zero idea of how to do a, an algorithm, you know. You, just, you, you may have no, no intelligence for language, but uh, a lot of intelligence for something else, you know. Yeah. And we see this all the time, but I think courage in a way, and I want you to speak on this, because you've got these badass dogs, but... What I hear you talking about is how to build those dogs, how to build their confidence. And it takes three years to really have what's called a stable, predictable animal that you can really utilize in various scenarios, which we'll break down in a little bit. But um, you proved that you had valor. You know, part of the reason people go, oh, you were a Navy SEAL is that the guy was brave. The guy was in combat. The maybe. guy went, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe, right? So, so. Talk to me about how you define courage, and does it exist? And is courage the ability to be scared out of your mind, but go anyway? Yeah, to me, to me, that you know, in short, is the essence of courage: is is that being scared shitless of doing something and going doing and doing it anyway. Where I think, as a society, we step on our own dick a little bit is that what what is courageous to one may not be to the other and that's why i said maybe is that you know i don't know if you're familiar with Anna, uh, alex honhold the the free free yes. climber yeah you know they, they did brain scans on him and, and a lot of his ability and it's not taking anything away from his skill he's a, he's a masterful rock climber and uh you know most people say that guy has balls that he has to cart around in a wheelbarrow but yeah. the reality of it is is that it doesn't scare him you know, and so what, Chuck Yeager was probably the same way. Yeah, you know, so what would terrify the shit out of most people for him is 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 no different than getting the fucking mail, you know. And and so to me that that's an important distinction to make. And and why I say maybe is that I, I really truly believe that most high level uh, special operators it's not that they're not cor courageous and it's not that there weren't times where I was scared to fucking death and went and did it anyway. There's certainly going to be moments like that, uh, but I also think that there is a genetic component 
that has to be uh, present for you to be able to do some of the things that, that are asked of those people. And so... And the same thing with dogs. The exact same thing with dogs, you know, because to your, to your question on like, you know, you, you, you know, what, what, what do you look for or, or how do you kind of reconcile that is that, you know, the, the genetic component, the best analogy I can give is the genetic component is like a, a, an amp for a stereo. Let's say it's, it's 50 watts, like that wattage is the genetics. Right? No matter what you do, that thing is putting out 50 amps. No, I mean, you can fucking dial in the treble and bass and, and master volume all you want, but the wattage is the fucking wattage. And so that wattage is going to be your cap as to, as to how much output there is no matter what. Where the training and, and the nurture, if you will, comes in is, is the sliders, is the, is the equalizer, the master volume. That, like Those are the training, the environment that you bring them up in, what have you. So if genetically you have 5,000 fucking watts to work with, and then somebody has the foresight and the competency to adjust the sliders to give that, that perfect sound, then you're going to operate at 5,000 watts. If you have 20 watts, I don't give a fuck if you put them with you know, every CAG guy that's running a training program and the, and the baddest motherfuckers on the planet. Like The fact is you've got 20 watts to work with, yeah. and, and that's the way it is. You know, this is such a taboo subject in a way, right? Because... You, the, the things you learn breeding dogs, I am sure, have changed the way you look at human beings. Everything. I mean, right? Like I said, I've learned more about people from working with dogs than anything. But, to, but, but and, and we all know, my buddy and I were just talking, there are just some people that are just, like my joke is, but it's true, my, I have a buddy who's just, he's just not dealing with uh, an advanced computer. Yeah. His model is, he's the iPhone one. Yeah. Like he just sometimes, you just catch him looking in the distance with his mouth open. I swear to God, it looks like he's like looking for moths. Yeah. Yeah. He's just like. Yeah, and, so, and he could hang out with uh, Einstein, you know, Elon it wouldn't Musk. Matter. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't matter, you know. And, but but so, so then, then it's interesting because yes, nurture, but yeah, nature too. It it's has that to be age both. old. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not either or, it's both. But how much credit then can you take for being brave? It doesn't sound like you take a whole lot of credit I, for I, being brave. I mean, less, less yeah. than I think you should, you know, because again, it's like, I mean, some of it is kind of almost that, uh, that matrix scenario where she says, don't worry about the vase, and he, and he turns around and bumps it, and she's like, the, the big mind fuck is if I hadn't said anything, would you have still broken that thing? It, it's kind of that same. You get back to religion. See, as I get older, and I'm yeah. 55. I know I look 40. Where's my camera? But at, at 55, I become more religious. I don't become less. My father was the opposite. But, yeah. but for me, uh, when you think about, let's just take the Judeo-Christian ethic. The idea behind monotheism is that we are all of the same moral worth. Yeah. So that, uh, and our justice system is predicated on the idea that if I kill a wretch on the street or I kill Bill Gates or I, 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 I kill Mike over here, I do the same amount of time. And, and, and that is a religious notion. It's not about how I can prove what your worth is in society. I, it's not about, hey, Elon Musk, you create more jobs, therefore you should do less time. No, 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 man. Because it's not for you to decide and it's not for a human being to decide what and who is worth how much. Yeah. We are all brothers and sisters under the same father, right? It's, that, that, it's, and, and I find that interesting. As somebody who didn't really spend a lot of time in church, I, I respect the idea behind the idea that we are, we, if you don't have a society that, that holds that as an ideal that you can't measure, yeah. right? Because you know with dogs you can measure that, and you know with people you can measure that. But if we start measuring that, and we start taking credit for, what we were, for the genetics we were born with, yeah. it's why a lot of societies that create a warrior class and they put the warrior class at the top don't do as well. Yeah. Because people have different... You know, yeah. well, traits, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, you know, t t like a doctor, right? Say, you know, from the warrior class standpoint, like, you know, maybe this guy is a, a spineless jellyfish of a man, but is a brilliant fucking brain surgeon. Exactly. Right? And so, like, exactly. he, he may not even be able to pre protect his own fucking family, but he may save that warrior's he's daughter. A, he's a healer. You exactly. Know? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, every, everybody has their, their place. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, I agree. I don't, I don't think that there should necessarily be any more importance uh, placed on that, and, and I really, and not to take away anything from, uh, you know, from the guys again, because there are a lot of scenarios where you're scared shitless and it sucks, and, and you go and do it anyway, and, and that is rare. But, um, but there's also a component, I think, that uh, that you know that that wattage, if you will, allows you to be able to even do that, whereas some people just physically can't fucking do it. You yeah. Know? So. Yeah. Um, you That's know, right. It, yeah, it's it's kind of a, a chicken or the egg. Uh, argument in in some ways that well, way. Well, we're going to put these dogs to a test, and we'll we'll bring this 
this to a to a close. But um, what are you going to? Uh, what are you going to show me? I want a tactical dog, man. Yeah. I know you have your kennel master here, and I want to know what scenarios I should be like. If I get a dog from you, I want to know. Like I, I was thinking about that. I was like, if I, if I, if I had the money to get a dog, and I might, and I might get a dog from you eventually. But like, I'm going to say, that, I'm going to be like, Mike, what can this dog do? Because I want to know what scenarios do you train a dog for. Yeah. So, and I guess I'll answer your first question first. What are we going to do with you? Is you're going to drop trial and we're going to smear peanut butter <laughs> over everything. Ah, finally, I'm getting so turned on. And, and, then, and, then it's and you're a, just going to have me run? Yeah, it's a race to 7-Eleven between you and the dog. So, peanut butter, yeah, huh? Peanut of butter. all things. Ch chunky peanut butter. Chunky. Yeah, well, they use their teeth a little more. If they do I got butter. you. I got you. Uh, no, now I know what this yeah. is about. So there, there's essentially three basic tenets of, um, from the protection dog standpoint, we'll leave the military and police out of this because there's a lot of, nuanced specialties, whether it's bomb, bomb dogs or, you know, bed, not bed bugs, cell phone detection in, in prisons, what have you. But uh, from a protection dog standpoint, there's, you know, carjacking, there's uh, home invasion, and then there's handler protection if you're out, you know, out and about walking around uh, or at a grocery store or what have you. So the, the three kind of common scenarios that will typically work are, you know, you, you walk up to, uh, to a vehicle, the, the dog is in the back, somebody tries to carjack somebody and the dog defends uh, the car and, and bites the assailant. Uh, from a home invasion uh, scenario, it's important to do both daytime and nighttime uh, because to the dog it's very different. Everything's super still at night, it's dark, and so they're gonna be a little more sensitive to, to noise. So I want them to have seen that picture uh, at least a few times. Daytime, uh, maybe their, their guard is a little down because people are coming in and out of the door uh, the fucking TV's on, you know, the fridge is opening, there's, there's activity. So they may not catch somebody coming, you know, through the front door or trying to crawl through a window or whatever as easily as they would at night. So doing both of those scenarios is important. Doing them from the front door, from the back door, from, you know, if you have an upstairs, uh, you know, doing them in kind of all different facets through the garage maybe. Uh, you know, basically any, any sight picture that that dog may uh, encounter as a protection dog, you obviously want them to have been exposed to that. The last one, the handler protection, let's say you're just out, out for a walk around the neighborhood, you're at a park, um, you know, you're at, you know, again, a restaurant sitting down, whatever, and, and somebody pops out of nowhere and, and uh, you know, assails the, the individual. Now, yeah, that's, like, that's like L.A. You, you've yeah. got people in Beverly Hills having lunch. Yeah, getting the Car stops, they come out with guns, boom, right yeah. there. Yeah. So the, the key thing there is, is, again, the genetic component. You know, the training is half of it. Um, the genetic component is where the command comes in. A very common question is, you know, hey, can I send you my golden retriever and, and you teach him to be a, a fucking pipe hitter? And the short answer is no. no. No different than I can't take, you know, the guy with the wrong stuff and put him around Einstein. I mean, one of the, the unfortunate realities of the dog business, and this is for police, military, protection, what have you, is, is that initial testing if they have that trait to actually do protection or, or apprehension slash bite work is very, very simple. And it's uh, an analogy I would use for, you know, if you were going to hire a bodyguard, is that let's say uh, I'm a prospective candidate, I'm at, at Denny's eating fucking breakfast, and, uh, you know, Mike Glover walks in, I don't know him from anybody, uh, but he walks up and he, he eye fucks me for a few seconds, I know he's looking at me and, and I'm looking around, he, he walks up and he just slaps the fuck out of me. <laughs> Right. For no reason. You know, at that point, I'm going to do one of two things. I'm, I'm going to call the police or cry for a manager. Or I'm going to stand up and it's going to be a fight. Yeah. The guy that won't fight in that scenario, that's intimidated, you know, that, that says, holy fuck, I need help. Do you think that there's any amount of, you know, grappling training, kickboxing training, mar you know, martial arts, combative shooting? No. It all goes out the window. That's going to make you feel comfortable with him guarding your family? Fuck no. no. Right. So unfortunately, it's the exact same thing with a dog. Like I can't take a dog that won't fucking rip my face off for picking a fight with him no more than than i can teach that guy to be a fucking warrior if his heart's not in it you yep. know so so that one singular kind of what we call a stakeout test is crucial yeah um, and and the reality of it is also is that 99.9 percent .9 of the dogs on the planet don't have that trait the same way most human beings don't have that trait um you know and so it's funny as, as for anybody listening young people you know you grow up in this culture thinking that you have to be tough you have to be a warrior when i accepted that my strength, I was always fairly athletic and I like all that, but when I accepted that my strength was not to be a Spartan, not to be a warrior, but to be a jackass, a professional jackass and make people <laughs> laugh, and I hope you come to my show tonight. Yeah. You know, that, that was when the whole world kind of like, things eased down. I was yeah. like, oh, that's not my 
That's not my role, man. Yeah. I'm supposed to be afraid. I'm supposed. That's part of the humor. That's part yeah. of my the the compensation that I take to yeah. you know is is uh, and I think we all just kind of like we we all have that role. Yeah. We're all born for something. I hope. Yeah, absolutely. You I know? mean, uh, yeah, like I said, you know, like we were talking about earlier. I think. You know, everybody has their thing, their niche in life that, uh, that that that's where they're supposed to be, and and you know, embrace it and be be the best at whatever that is. Uh, Are there any other dogs that you uh, could you ever take an Australian cattle dog? Is there any other dog that you could turn turn into a biter? I guess it depends. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say in, in each breed there are probably uh, anomaly individuals that that would be able to do it. It's yeah. just you know, from an efficiency standpoint, especially when there's business principles yeah. involved, like finding that it's, it's not cost productive, yeah. you know, uh, it's prohibitive. Yeah. So uh, have I seen, you know, catch dogs or, or gnarly fucking ranch, you know, cattle dogs on a ranch somewhere that will absolutely eat somebody's ass and, and put them in the hospital? Yes. Do they have that same level of, of confidence and sociability that you can throw them into an armored personnel carrier or a fucking helicopter with 30 dudes in it at yeah. night when there's flash crashes? Probably not, you know? So wow. th that's what I mean is that, is that to, to have all of those things in one package Such a is, versatile is very animal. rare. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's like it's a jack most, of all trades. Yeah, it's the, it's the most utilitarian uh, example of a dog that, that I think exists, you know? That's amazing. I'm excited. Let's get to work. Let's do it. Let's do this. That was our interview, everybody. Amen. Yeah. Brian Callen. This is his intro song. Brian.